Of course they're not volcanic, but what are they? And based on all the other evidence, it started to mount, uh, like a police investigator, the degrees of probability increased and our excitement started to increase also. What went through my mind was watching the experience Bob was having. He pulled out his Bible and started to write some things in his Bible, and, and I know Bob went through a lot of on top of Chapel Hill Laws. We thought that we might be standing on holy ground. I mean, just think about the significance of Sinai. It was a moment for me. The Bible became vibrantly real at that moment. To think that I could be standing where Moses was told to take off the sandals. And I looked down and I said, hmm, there could be something to this story. You know, the blackened rocks up there and all the other things. That there might be some of this after this stuff here in Saudi Arabia. Now the thing I'm thinking about is, is if this is the real Mount Sinai, the world needs to know that this is not myth and legend, not allegory. This is real. And I said to Larry, I said, you know, what are we doing here? And I'll never forget, Larry looks over and looks me right in the eye and said, Bob, I think we're making history. With darkness approaching, the two use night vision goggles to find their way. As they descend, they come upon an amazing sight. The Bible talks about this altar that Moses made at the foot of the mountain and established 12 stone pillars. And they did burnt offerings at this site. And it's at the foot of the mountain. Angular shaped. Angular shaped. It had two channels on it. It may not be the ultimate answer, but if you got four aces, you better bet you're going to win the hand. And I like this is we got four aces with the king kicking it. This is this is a lot of stuff is going here. Though excited about their discoveries, Cornuke and Williams know they need to find at least one other distinguishing feature on the mountain if this is the true Mount Sinai. Well, Mount Sinai and Horeb are synonymous. They mean the same thing in Scripture. And to be the real Mount Sinai, you need to have a cave on that mountain. And the Bible specifically talks about a cave on the mountain that Elijah visited with a cloak over his face and he looked out at the valley below, the Bible says. Looking across from their position, they spot what appears to be the opening of a large cave. Though unable to reach it, Cornuke and Williams clearly know its significance. When you go to St. Catharines, there's no cave there. He said, where did Elijah go? He wanted to manufacture and put a cave that fits with what the Bible says you couldn't put it in a better location. Now in broad daylight, and with the increasing probability that they will be discovered, the pair decide to make their way down the mountain, quickly. And Bob slipped a little bit at one point. I slipped bad, and there was a deep crevasse that went down 50 feet, and this shale came loose, and I slid, and I just started clawing desperately, trying to grab some brush or something, and was going off the edge. And Larry swung his hand and grabbed my vest, and we realized that we were pushing it too hard. We're out of water, we're going to kill ourselves. When you go do an investigation as a police officer, as I've done many investigations, if you're looking at the wrong suspect, nothing's going to fit. It's going to be a frustrating, fruitless investigation. But if you find the right guy, everything starts falling into place. If I was a district attorney, I'd certainly prosecute this mountain as being Mount Sinai. The jury hasn't come in yet, okay? But I think we've been the jury. Arrested by a desert frontier patrol shortly after leaving the mountain, Cornuke and Williams sadly must throw much of their most valuable evidence into the desert as they are led to the authorities in Tobuk. So winning the jury on just their own findings with what little evidence they are able to keep might have proven impossible and caused this adventure to slip into the dust pile of undocumented myth and legend. But amazingly, the findings of another unique pair of explorers provide even more compelling evidence and credibility to the historic discoveries made by Cornuke and Williams four years earlier. At great peril, great risk, they went out to this mountain on several occasions, did extensive research, lived amongst the rocks, took their children with them. This is a phenomenal family that knew the implications of what was at this mountain and took it upon themselves to go and try and find the best evidence. Working for an American oil company based in Saudi Arabia, 
the Caldwells are subject to company policy imposed by the Saudi government that all foreigners leave the country for at least 24 days of the year. In the aftermath of the Gulf War, Jim and Penny's travel options are limited, so a trip to the west, toward Egypt, becomes a clear option. St. Catharines is first on their list of sites to visit. Yeah, it took everything out of me when we got there to see that it, it just didn't match the biblical description. Jim and Penny's travel options are limited, so a trip to the west, toward Egypt, becomes a clear option. St. Catharines is first on their list of sites to visit. Yeah, it took everything out of me when we got there to see that it, it just didn't match the biblical description. I was so disappointed. Deciding to leave St. Catharines, the Caldwells continue their journey through Egypt, where a brief stop in a roadside bookstore reveals a surprise in the form of a book called The Gold Mines of Midian. We began to look at it. It was written by Sir Richard Burton in the 1800s. He was an explorer of vast amounts of the former Ottoman Empire, including Arabia. And he had drawn a map in the back, and as we pulled that map out, that map had a beautiful rendition of the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba, Sinai Peninsula, but it also had just a little portion of this uh, northwestern quadrant of Arabia, and it listed that land as M-A-D-Y-A-N. He's saying Midian's over there, and if you can find Midian, you can find the region where Mount Sinai was, because that's where Moses was supposedly tending the flocks of Jethro. Well, we found another book in the bookstore called The Mountain of God. This was by Emmanuel Anadi. He also mentions Jebel al Laws as being a potential site. The Caldwells pack up and head for Saudi Arabia and begin to search for the highest mountain in Midian. Though free to travel through Saudi Arabia on work visas, no permission has been granted to enter the government-imposed forbidden zone around Jebel al Laws. The mountain peak seemed extraordinarily high to me, and even the very top of Jebel Al Laws was even enshrouded in cloud from time to time. That's how high it appeared, and that was my first reaction that, gosh, this is so much different than the uh, picture that came to my mind in St. Catharines, the traditional site of Mount Sinai. We're at the 4,000-foot level. These mountains are way up there, another 4,000, 5,000 feet above us. The altar with petroglyphs is their first discovery. We came around the front side of that and didn't really see anything, but as you go around to the back side, the cows started becoming very visible. My daughter was there, and she says, Dad, there's 12 cows. Okay, good. And she was only like eight years old at the time. They came out of Egypt. They would have been knowledgeable of the worship of this pagan idol called Apis or Hathor. When they said that Moses was not coming down from the mountain after he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights, they reverted back to their pagan ways. Moses asks Aaron, I've come down the mountain, what on earth has happened here? And Aaron says, I took the ornaments from them, I took their gold, I put it into the fire and out popped this calf. But he makes it very plain that there was a single calf. I built the altar, I put it on the altar, and I turned to the people and I said, These be thy gods, plural. O Israel, which have led thee up out of the land of Egypt. It's something struck me very strange about that, because if you put one golden calf atop an altar, why would you say, these be thy gods, O Israel, if you've got one golden calf? Did he make more than one golden calf? You know, it, it puzzled me for a good length of time. Like Bob and Larry, the Caldwells look for the scriptural indicators. In studying some of the Hebrew, it says that Aaron fashioned the calf with a graving tool. It literally says, to engrave, as in something we would engrave a name on today. That sounds very strange because you, you, you mold something that's molten. You don't engrave it. But the way you built an altar in Egypt was to, in relief, cover it with gods and then put a chief deity, a statue of the chief deity, on it. If a golden calf were to have been put on the top, that scripture would not contradict itself. It would absolutely perfectly fit. And he would have placed it atop and said, in fact, 